My name is Paul Dexter. Johnny's least talented, <laughs> younger, tallest, handsome, <laughs> and obviously least humorous. Part. I was asked to make to make some opening remarks here, and I wanted to begin by declaring this is not a funeral. Johnny never wanted a funeral. What I see here is a gathering of friends and fellow musicians who felt strongly that something special was needed to mark Johnny's passing and to celebrate him in the language he understood and deeply loved. We all know how music can express so much more than words about meaning, beauty, joy, and sorrow. Music creates life, and music creates light. So I think it's right and honorable that we gather and be uplifted and share the light of your and Johnny's music. And I have a couple of uh, uh, personal remarks that I'd like to make. Um, you've, I'm sure, read the list of Johnny's many professional accomplishments in the July issue of Allegro. Uh, the local 802's uh, magazine. Uh, the photo on the cover of your program is from that beautifully written tribute and shows typical Johnny coaching the string quartet in Hamburg, Germany in 2014. I knew my brother as always living in three circles simultaneously. Foremost of these was his circle New York City's finest professional musicians, you folks, and you folks. Like our father, John R. Dexter, it seemed to me that Johnny knew almost every professional musician in town, and so many others elsewhere also. In that circle, Johnny was known to not only play the correct notes as written, but also to contribute his emotion and his artistic understanding of those words and his understanding of the person who composed those notes. Many recognized and admired that talent of his, although Johnny was always quite modest about any of the recognition he received, and he received quite a lot. As a gifted teacher, he shared his talents and influenced the lives of so many others. What a privilege that was. His was a big circle, which continued to expand even after he retired, much to his satisfaction and enjoyment. I think Johnny's next most important circle was more dancing. He was instrumental in helping to create and shape what became a large community of men and women dedicated to performing and carrying on that ancient English tradition of horse dancing and hiking at midnight on the Appalachian Trail and digging trains and drinking warm beer. <laughs> as, the Allegro, as the Allegro article stated, Johnny was born into a family of professional musicians and I saw family as Johnny's third most important circle. He and our brother, he and our brother Mark Dexter, are the best examples of what it is to follow in your parents' footsteps. Mark continues to shred guitar licks in his 1980s tribute band in Hawaii, the Ferris Bueller Band, about as well as Johnny shredded the viola licks. <laughs> in the various ensembles in which he played the music of the dead composers. I don't know shredding, I'm a singer, so I don't know all, all of that. Our parents taught us what personal level of, of, of what a personal level of excellence is, and the importance of independent thought and of wisdom and absurd humor. And I'm certain that you saw also those traits in John. Even though our families of siblings never lived close to each other, we all felt a definite family bond that 
was very Midwest traditional and was always important to John. That Dexter family bond became especially important over the last three years as Zoom technology enabled our family to become closer and to watch how Johnny realistically faced the effects of his unforgiving cancer. I cherish those families, those family Zooms with Johnny. And I know that eventually I will get used to not having him to joke with, to connect to, to confide in. It does feel weird to me. But I feel good knowing that Johnny's light still shines and still inspires. Okay, turn in the page again. This event could not have happened without a bunch of people who offered to help in many different ways. And please allow me, I'd like to especially recognize several of those people. Dr. Anthony Vine was a good friend and a musical colleague of Johnny's. And from the moment of Johnny's diagnosis, Dr. Vine truly went above and beyond to make sure that Johnny had the very best care of him as quickly as possible. We all know that medical prognosis of pancreatic, pancreatic cancer is almost always grim, but Dr. Vine was instrumental in creating a way for Johnny which was not grim but rather honest and realistic. That was so important for Johnny and for everyone who knew Johnny. Thank you, Dr. Bob. The Bowery Boys, Johnny's beloved Morse dance team that he helped to found way back in the last morning, in 1979. That was when the Morse dancing was not a thing in the United States like it had been for just heard today was over a thousand years in England, rural villages. Being a member of the Morris community brought Johnny great enjoyment and fulfillment. It was a central activity in his life. Johnny was the person most responsible for his team's specific style, a certain style, I think that's what it is. A combination of strength and elegant grace that is still wild, wild, wildly admired by those who were fortunate enough to dance with or to watch the Bowery Boys. And to the hundreds of Morris dancers who went to a Suds, a traveling Morris, and it was clear that for Johnny, it was the histories and the traditions of the various dance styles that he insisted be expressed authentically. How high to jump when they use sticks, how loud the, the crack of the sticks. That attitude and those nuances were Johnny's fundamentals. Monday night practices were truly sacred commitments on his calendar, and so was the Charlotte's. Johnny considered his worst teammates as family, and their brotherhood is an incredibly and perpetually strong bond. Morse dancing kept Johnny's life anchored and balanced. And so when asked, why do Morse dancers always wear bells? He knew that it was not primarily so they could also annoy the blind. <laughs> Thank you, Bowery Boys. And for any other Morse men and women who are here in the audience. You probably don't hear your bells, but. <laughs> Beatrice Francier. As an amateur violinist and a good friend of Johnny's, Beatrice attended many, many workshops where Johnny was on the faculty, and she contributed financially towards this memorial tribute event, and she personally solicited other donors. <coughs> She also generously host, is, is hosting Yitka, Yasin Pogo, our visiting cellist from Prague. Here's a story. During early COVID, Johnny and Beatrice, Beatrice would periodically sit on a bench in Central Park just to chat and to, and to catch up. 
When he returned from those chats, Karen would also ask, so how is Beatrice? And he would always reply with a big smile on his face, she's just great. <laughs> Johnny really enjoyed those conversations and was always uplifted. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Cal Wierzer. There's Cal. As always, John's longtime professional colleague in the New York City freelance scene, and as Manhattan Quartet's second violinist for over 25 years, Cal was an outstanding colleague and a true friend. Johnny held the highest level of respect for Cal as a violinist. And a very special bond in their relationship is that they were both, for all those years, the inner voices of the Manhattan String Quartet. Cal and Johnny were of one mind, and Cal will carry on Johnny's role as head of faculty and the director of chamber music for the amateur quartet workshops that he and Karen organized for so many years. And Cal has done a superb job of organizing the performers for today's memorial tribute and also for the play-in, starting at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning at Dillard Quayle School of Music across the park. Thank you, Kathy. And Karen Spinner, Johnny's dear friend, confidant, co-host, business partner, muse, caregiver, and executive, and likely several other dimensions of a relationship that only they together knew. You all know Karen, of course. She and Johnny worked so hard together on almost every musical adventure or social event that they dreamt of together, except probably for Morse events, which probably were not allowed to touch, I would guess. <laughs> Karen understood Johnny thoroughly and loved him honestly. And without her dedication, support and care throughout his final illness, his life would have been quite unbearable. And we all saw that that was not the case. And we are all very grateful. Thank you, Karen. And finally, I'd like to share some words that I saw in a recent online announcement by Brian O'Donovan. Know him or not, but the, he's a beloved Celtic personality known all over New England for his weekly radio program on, on WGBH, a Celtic Sojourn, and for hosting and producing the annual performances of a Celtic Sojourn. And who has for decades been dedicated to preserving and celebrating the traditions of Celtic music, dance, and storytelling. To me, that sounds pretty familiar. He said, may the echoes of our music continue to resonate in your hearts, and may the warmth of our shared experiences keep you company through life's journey. Thank you. And I think now I need to introduce David, David Leibovitz. And the members of the New York Repertory Orchestra, Jose Mozart. Uh, he also played in uh, 
Berlioz, uh, Harold, and Italy with us. And then uh, after that, the Mozart Symphony Contretemps with Toby. And I said, John, you know, that's not for two violas. <laughs> um, but in, in addition to that, on that program, uh, we also played the Shostakovich Eighth Symphony. And John said, can I play in the orchestra for that piece? Because he had never played the and over the years, on several occasions, he would say, what are you doing this year? What's the next piece? And if it was something that he hadn't played before or was interested in, he would come and sit in. He said, you don't mind if I sit in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I we don't mind if you sit in. Um, so it, over the years, he, you know, the, the section, of course, loved having him sit in with us. And it was great that he that he came in with such an open and generous spirit to play with, with us. Uh, personally, I, the last time I spoke to John was a couple of days before he passed, and um, we had planned to have a, to meet for dinner the following week. And so we chatted, and my dad had passed away the day before, and we, we were chatting about these things. I said, well, I hope we're going to see you next week. And he said, fuck hope. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do it. <laughs> and I mean, I think that's just, you know, really, that was John. <laughs> <laughs> fuck hope. We're going to do it. And, um, you know, sadly we didn't. But we're doing this for him. So thank you.
the last Monday in May, I was invited over to a neighbor's for dinner on their patio, along with another couple in the neighborhood. So I brought a fruit salad, but at the last minute, I also grabbed my ukulele and a bunch of song sheets <clears throat> so we could have a surprise ending to the meal. But I did not expect the gift that I got. After dinner, I unpacked my uke, handed out the songs, and we started playing and singing. I heard our five voices start to sing, and a minute later, another voice joined in. I looked up at the nearby lilac bush, and there he was, a bright red cardinal. He sang and he sang, loud, strong, for the whole 30 to 40 minutes that we were singing. He didn't stop. He didn't stop once. And he accompanied us on every single song. So I looked up the, the uh, symbolism of the cardinal. And according to Native American legend, a cardinal represents a loved one who has passed away. He is seen as a messenger delivering love and comfort during difficult times, and as an uplifting sign that those we have lost will live forever and never be forgotten. So for me, this was the perfect memorial day, because there we both were singing and playing music together again. So I'm just going to end, forgive my voice, <laughs> just with a uh, short, short, two-line um, expression of memories. It's not exactly Mozart, but if you know it, join in. And it goes like this. Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. Those were the days, oh yes, those were the days.
he said he was there too, so we had a little cry together. And when I caught myself crying to John Dexter, who is and remains to me the epitome of strength and vigor, I started crying more because it meant that this was real, this terrible thing, this impossible news. He said he was concerned about people feeling awkward around him and it changing things. He wanted people to just come and hang out, not act strange. So he talked about some other things. He said he passes the photo of May Day, 1983, every day in his hallway. I was three years old. He says, you're on a bicycle or a tricycle. Margaret's there, my dad, my mom. That's when he said, we've had a good run, haven't we? He knew me then before my parents divorced. And of course, he's like a father to me. And that's why I'm such a mess. <laughs> I mean that in that I was crying, actually, that's <laughs> Although maybe there's another meaning there too, I don't know. I said more than I meant there. Um, I was at his wedding to Heidi, I must have been seven years old. And what I remember is him taking her garter off with his teeth. I'd never seen anything like that and it made me want to grow up. <laughs> I remember traveling to California when I was 14 for Gordy's dream tour in Bolinas. We were staying in a big house. John called out, Jamie, wake up! Wash your pits in your dick and get on your whites! <laughs> Nobody's ever told me to take a shower like that before or since. John could be gruff and outrageous and he cursed like a sailor. But it was a great gruff. It disarmed you, made you ready to throw cares aside and dance. And it felt so good to dance, to dance well, to be alive, to smile at the guy across the set from you. After hanging up the phone that day, for some reason I remembered those times he had called out some of the other Morris teams for dancing poorly. It wasn't the nicest thing to do, it might not have been necessary, but it was true. They were dancing badly. <laughs> and he wanted the Morris to be truly beautiful, not half ass He wanted it to be full. There's a picture of the Bowery Boys at Backstead in England in 1985. All six guys up in the air in rounds during bats. Six guys all over six feet tall, all elevated in the air in a giant set, slightly leaned in because of their momentum and direction. The Brits had never seen Morris dancing like that before. And by Americans, <laughs> how peculiar that must have been for them. We went to England again in 1993 when I was 13, and John put me in that final show dance at Backstead. Just like that picture. 2,000 people, all watching as we danced our asses off. <laughs> The look on John's face as we walked off, I don't know how to describe it. Joy, pride, celebrating each and every person out there. He really loved Morris Denson. The joy that gave us all, that stemmed, that all stemmed from him. Later that night in England in 1993, Morris Denson started singing in this huge banquet hall. Hundreds of men, gathered around drinking beer. Morris songs are generally about drinking or beer. <laughs> or for some variety, drinking beer. Or their sea shanties, which are also about beer and drinking. It's pretty fantastic when you hear several hundred men singing together at the top of their lungs. Then John got up and he started to sing Plain Old Soldier. Please sing it with me if you know it. Nothing but a plain old soldier, an old revolutionary soldier, for I carried the gun where noble deeds were done, and the name of my 
commander was George Washington. <laughs> there we were in England. <laughs> That takes some chutzpah. <laughs> 400 Englishmen. They weren't singing along. <laughs> now, many of you know John from the professional classic music world here in New York City, from the Manhattan String Quartet world, the ballet, the opera, or his many other professional exploits. But even though I am a professional conductor, I knew John almost entirely through the Morris. Like him, for the most part, I've kept these two worlds distinct. And to be standing up here in Pitt, in front of some of my colleagues, is something I thought about before doing it. And then I said, fuck it. <laughs> I think that's what John would tell me. But like John, these two worlds have always informed each other in my life. And he did play principal viola for me once, with Beethoven IV in the Bronx. He showed up early, made everyone feel good about themselves, led the section beautifully, and he even paid attention to what I was doing on the podium. <laughs> From my very first year, I've only known a world that had John Dexter at the center of it. My father danced on the Bowery Boys from near the beginning of the team. I joined when I was a kid of nine years old when my stepfather, Henry, joined. Now my nephew, Leo, dances. My mother was an original member of the Ring of Elves, and my sister never missed a May Day for decades. So my mother likes to say, with quite a bit of pride, that she's the only person in the world who has a grandson, a son, and two husbands, <laughs> all on the Bowery Boys. Probably a record that it may not, I don't know if that's going to be broken many times. So. One year, John and I were driving to Vermont together, just the two of us. He said, can you feel it? We're getting closer. Can you feel the magic of the Morris? He made that real, the magic of the Morris. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a thunderstorm at 3 p.m. It started raining at 4 p.m., but for about 25 minutes while we danced, there was no rain. The magic of the Morris. John loved Morris dancing. He first learned to dance when he was 19, when he traveled from Iowa to Pinewoods to study viola de gamba with Martha Blackman. But he ended up Morris dancing. He joined the Pinewoods Morrisman in 1966, then the Village Men in New York City, learning from Eric Lieber. When he was in the Army and stationed at West Point, he and Fred Pajerski used to dance in New York all night, then drive back to West Point at 4 a.m. in time for revenue. In 1973, John went to England as a part of the first tour of American Morris dancers to dance back in England where Morris dancing comes from. And in his own words, when he returned, he was a changed man, and he founded the Binghamton Morrisman in 1973. Then, when he moved to New York, where he started the Bowery Boys in 1979 with other Binghamton men, Peter Darkman, Michael Gorin, Steve Ruszewski, Jack Finn, Terry Pierce. Terry's son, Graham, is now the foreman of the Bowery Boys. The Bowery Boys' first tour was in May 1980. And he created a larger gathering from several teams later on called the American Traveling Morris, which continues to meet every summer for a week. All of those teams are still thriving. John described one of those ATM tours like this, and I quote, Doubtless it was different for other men, but for some the visceral anticipation of this August event began with the arrival of a fine letter announcing, among, among other things, the promise of a memorable tour, a campsite fraught with such natural beauty as to cause spontaneous moments of rapture, a brewery, possible canoeing, nights illuminated by, in addition to the men's inner light, that of the full moon and possible fierce lightning, other enticements. 
These things were found to be very hard to resist by some. In fact, those who are truly in touch with their Morris light energy, one word, felt and heard collectively the sound of pencils being put down, books quietly being closed, letters of resignation being written in the cases of work difficulties, and the great collective sigh of blessed relief as this moment of truth and nature became a real force in our lives once again. Suddenly, cloudy issues became clear and life's purpose on Earth became obvious as concentration shifted from mundane onera to the light of vacation with friends. <laughs> That's how John felt about the traveling Mars. John died in June. For 38 years, June was the month of the Bowery Boys, hosting one of his greatest creations, the Suds, which is spelled P-X-E-U-D-Z or S-U-D-X or it's actually spelled a different way every year so anyway, this was a gathering of one to two hundred men who would come for a weekend, sleep in a field, off in money, board school buses and dance all over northwestern Connecticut all day Saturday, have an outrageous cake and tea at Martha's house, then do a giant grand one mile long Windsor processional downhill into Falls Village, which John pronounced Falls Village, <laughs> and do our best dances for a huge crowd, then have a feast in the village hall with beautiful art by Gordy Curtis, questionable food, preposterous speeches, cigars, brandy, and general mayhem. John would preside over this proceeding from the head table and call upon people to speak. Real Charlie, who is a true Englishman, would speak on any obscure or banal topic. Didn't matter what, as long as he had the accent, it worked. <laughs> Michael Warren would convince us of things we knew were not true. Grant would sometimes play the lute or the piano, and people would swing from things and throw paper airplanes. It was a great way to grow up. On the walls were posters and photos from years past, outrageous paper mache dragons that they had brought to camp, great photos of excellent dancing. And in the first years of the Suds, John insisted that every person there walk back to the field where they were camped by hiking a portion of the Appalachian Trail in the pitch black and sopping drunk. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. The magic of the Morris. Everyone who attended those years remembers those walks rather vividly, and they were legendary by the time I joined the team. So we still walked back to camp, and now on paved roads. And I remember one of those walks, late at night, we were the last to leave the hall, we closed up, turned the lights off, and Jim Morrison, who was a man in his 50s at the time, danced the whole two miles back to camp, uphill. It was awesome. What a thing to be a part of as a teenager, to see a grown man dance two miles in the dark with the joy. Now John loved camp life as a part of Morris dancing. He stayed out by the fire until three or four in the morning, most nights. Then he was up first thing, drinking strong coffee with one half and one half, which he always spelled out in numbers, never in letters and words. Those Morris tours, could feel surreal. The latrine was dug far away, sometimes a half mile from camp. So there would be this incredible parade of men walking out to the latrine and others walking back like planes approaching LaGuardia. <laughs> then you'd take your turn. And John had left a little Walkman that played tapes of the Beatles. So you'd be sitting there with this truly, uniquely terrible smell. 100 men camping in a field together, you can get the idea. Looking out over the glory of the Connecticut hills, listening to Yellow Submarine. <laughs> when the weekend was over, we would carefully take the memorabilia off the walls and dr drive the folding chairs to the church a few towns over, sitting in the back of a pickup truck. And that was my childhood. I figured it was a pretty normal way to grow up. <laughs> My childhood was filled with these Morris tours. My father joined the team when I was one. He described why he joined this way. He saw John Dexter dancing, and he said he wanted to join, but a back injury 
1977, I'll quote him, put the idea of joining John Dexter and Morris Dancing out of reach for me, seemingly forever. But I tried going to practice one night in 1981 anyway, worked on coordinating the handkerchiefs and footwork tentatively, and it helped my back. How could that be? But there was no denying the evidence. Soon I was at practice in Bowery with Bowery every week. It was more fun than I had ever imagined. So I have to say, as his son, I've never seen my father as happy as he was when he was dancing. And there you have it, proof that Morris dancing can heal even a broken back. Now as a kid, every May 1st, my entire family would wait before dawn and help the Bowery boys carry a tree cut illegally from Riverside Park or from Steve Bluestone's property or from his famous neighbor's property. I won't tell you who that is, but ask him. And with my stepfather, Henry Chapin, singing Hal and Toe, carry that maypole down the 82nd Street. And then we'd go back to Jesse's, or recently to Mark's, where we'd have proper bagels with locks, Scottish locks that Jim Moxley would bring. John would make his beans with more whiskey than beans. And when I was a kid, I would go to elementary school. Feeling a little funny from those beans. <laughs> my first tour as a nine-year-old was what they called an eat the bag tour. We would dance, collect money, and then go to Orlini's, where we would eat an outrageous meal in a restaurant that looked like it came from the set of The Godfather. And we paid for the meal with the money we collected, counting out quarters and dimes on that giant table in the dusty room in the back. I think every kid should get to be on a team with guys like that. Jack Finn used to give me hugs when I was a kid. They almost broke my back. It was so strong. It was bear hugs. Now I get to give those hugs to my sons. As I've grappled with his death these past few months, I've been thinking about how, even though he didn't have kids of his own, what a father figure he has been to so many of us. He was consistent, dependable, unwavering, positive, confident, affirming, all the things I hope to be for my sons, Thomas and Moon. And I really love and admire how he transitioned from being a father figure to a friend. When I was 20, I started my own Morris team at Oberlin, and he came out there to Ohio. He drove his big old slide machine with him. You know those things? Slide machines, remember them? He took that out to, to Oberlin, and he showed these new dancers pictures of England, pictures of great dancing. And I remember calling him on, before May Day, saying, John, how do I get a permit to put the maypole in Tappan Square? He said, Jammer, if you ask for permission, what would they say? <laughs> So we did not ask for permission, we just did it. <laughs> On certain tours at certain times, he would ask me to sing a song that I loved and that he loved, and he would look far away, and I could tell it was because he was glad. One of his great gifts is that he made everyone around him feel good. My friend Chris Brockman joined for a few years, great concert pianist now. He took a walk past John's apartment after midnight, the week after he died, Chris and I. He said, John made me feel good about myself in a way that no one else had for the first 40 years of my life. Like Chris, I've lived so much of my life in a state of performing. Being on stage, publicly auditioning for jobs, winning some, not, not winning others, getting reviews, winning a Grammy, getting other awards. But what's so great about the Morris community John formed is that we didn't have to be succeeding in our careers to be welcomed. That's such a gift, to have a place where you could come and be welcome and celebrated and part of what was happening, even when work was shitty, when relationships were cracking or failing, falling apart. You could come and dance, you could talk about it, or you could not talk about it, just dance. I took that for granted, but it's hard to find. It's precious. A group of people who are there for each other, whatever else is going on. And John built that community. And I wonder whether that was what he was proud of more than anything else. Rude said on the Zoom call a while ago that there is never any bullshit with John. That is rare indeed 
to go to a place where there's absolutely no posturing, that's a gift in itself. And yet everything with John and Nora stemmed from the dancing. With John, the dancing was truly excellent. The feeling of pride of being a part of something great. All of us are so proud to be Valkyrie boys. Proud to wear the kit, proud of the lore, McSorley's in the early years. Crazy stuff they did on 14th Street before I was born. And part of the lore for all these years are the things that John said consistently for 40 years. Don't fuck it up, he would say right before he went out to dance. I still hear John saying that in my head before I go and conduct. Every time. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> Give us all or most of your money, he would say to a crowd. And sometimes they did. I actually said that at an orchestra concert as music director. I turned around, wasn't thinking very much, and I said, Give us all or most of your money. And coincidentally or not, that was the year the orchestra turned it around and started going into black. <laughs> Might have been a coincidence. We will give you 100% guaranteed one year's good luck, he would say. But my favorite of all is what he would say in practice sometimes. Better, but still bad. <laughs> Almost every single lesson I give, in almost every single rehearsal where I'm conducting, I'm thinking, better, but still bad. <laughs> and I have to do everything I have my power to hold that in and not say it out loud. <laughs> then there is his praise. Not bad, as a compliment. Not bad, he'd say with an exclamation mark, but also a twinkle in his eye. Not bad. Pretty good. That was even better than not bad. <laughs> but best of all was when he said, fucking hell. <laughs> that meant it was really good. Fucking hell. Then he would say, never change anything ever. And that's the mug that we gave him in 2007. This is his mug, Jess lent it to me for about these minutes up here while I'm speaking, which says, never change anything, ever. He said that about our Morris tradition, you know, about our dancing tradition. He said that about our nights that we would practice, which was Monday night, when the theaters were dark. Because even though his worlds were kept divided, they were always interacting. So we danced on the one night that he didn't have a gig. Monday. I know many of you know him as a violist, but he was a damn fine fiddle player. His double stops on the Morris tunes, the way he roughed up the pickups to lift the men off the ground, the way he played and led the dancing with his playing, how he could get you to jump just a bit higher, put in just a bit more verb on the super step and check your lines in the landing because his rhythm was so good and solid. My mom says that when I first started violin lessons when I was six, the teacher had to tell me to stop playing like this. <laughs> because that was what I thought you were supposed to do when you played violin. <laughs> he took the playing of those simple Morris tunes as seriously as he took the Beethoven string quartets. He had such a love and deep appreciation for the playing of chess. He made sure we knew how lucky we were to dance to her playing, how she helped to teach us through her playing, how it felt to have the two of them respect each other so much, the leader, your one dancer, and the musician. In practice, he had a particular desire for the energy to be unified with us all landing together. That's what mattered more than anything, landing together. The way it felt to have six guys all land at exactly the same time and shake the floor. And I learned so much about other things that matter from him through the Morris, his way of sharing his vision with Gordy. Their friendship, the way they asked so much of each other, 
the deep aesthetic purpose Gordy put into the dance and how John rose to that, even beyond his own vision. I saw what a friendship could look like, how these two grown men could learn from each other about art, music, and food, be challenged by each other, have disagreements, and grow. Gordy is the one who introduced me to classical music and the reason that I became a conductor. He first brought me to Carnegie Hall, first introduced me to Ali Gadankazan, he introduced me to K511, the Rondo in A minor, the Wanda Nadaska recording. And I learned later, last year, that it was John telling Gordy what to bring me to, what music to listen to. So it was John all along. <laughs> Didn't know that until last year. But he celebrated everyone around him. He celebrated the most beautiful dancer, as he called him, Jim Stevenson, who was truly the most beautiful dancer. How he celebrated Rube, had him teach us. Because John was our squire, he was our squire for life. He was unquestionably always the leader, but he was strong enough in his leadership that so often it was other people who took the lead. Tim Shaw became our tour master, Supreme for Life, John's title for him, almost 20 years ago. He knew how to build other people up around him. He was the center of our world, but he didn't put himself in the center. And he even told me he didn't like being at the center that much. But he had to do it in order to bring this whole community together. It was never about ego for him, and he had a particular abhorrence for narcissists. That is perhaps something that comes naturally, develops by playing in an orchestra. That was supposed to be the last line. But... <laughs> anyway, uh, conductors, narcissists, whatever. Um, not dead yet, he used to say, after we would dance. He'd say that in the morning, drinking a strong coffee after going to bed at two. Not dead yet, he'd say, after a good strong dance. But how is it now that he is actually dead? He was as close to immortal as we have known, larger than life and presence. We did feel intimidated by him, but that was good too. It was good to feel awe about someone, just by how they carried themselves and how they acted. I can't think of a time when he didn't comport himself in a way that was unlike himself. His kit was always beautifully pressed. Even late at night at camp, he always looked good. Which is not the case for most of the guys in my life. Now I find myself thinking about how it is that we can carry on without John, how we carry John's energy with us. Well, on more stores, John would say, read the monument. If we were on a tour, we'd stop. Most people wouldn't want to, but we'd stop and we'd read a monument in the middle of nowhere. He said, we must read the monument. I don't know why, but it seems important to do so. So I would suggest that John, has his own monuments in each of us. Some of those photos bring it back to life. If you go back and watch videos of Bowery Boys in the 80s, the 90s, or today, you can see, you can feel his radiance pouring out. Read the monument. In February 2020, when the suds was pronounced over, John wrote this to me. We were deadly serious about the dancing whilst reveling in the humor. He loved to use the word whilst. He was talking about. Musicians understand this feeling perhaps better than mere civilians. Don't suck. One must practice hard, get better, then show your stuff to the team and to the onlookers. We do that as well as any team does, possibly even a bit better. And that is our legacy already, and our representation of that to find the weekend nail in a certain way. And I think other teams attended understood that. It made the Falls Village stand special. Everyone did their best, in some cases, in spite of themselves. I think that is John's effect on all of us. Everyone did their best, in some cases, in spite of themselves. Last year, when he was diagnosed, I was making my New York Bill debut, months after John's diagnosis. And they put me up in the beacon 
I've never stayed in a hotel in New York City before, but they kind of said I had to, so I decided I would. And I was John's neighbor for two weeks, and we attended the same gym. Sometimes I would see him there, skinny, deadlifting 250 pounds. It's really hard to see him look that skinny, but he was strong as hell. And I think that's John's spirit. It's really awful. I've been crying in the shower, crying in the train station, crying on the train, crying on the Zoom call. I'm someone who cries once every few years, and I've cried more times in the past few months than I have in probably 45 years. 43, 43, 43 years. <laughs> as cruel as it is that he's gone, it is a gift that he has been with us for all these years. And Karen wrote this to me. One thing I've found to be very helpful are some wise words from a friend. To remember that grief is love. Love with no place to go. So it is important that aching, empty feeling comes, when that comes, to recognize what it is, channel it into something positive. That tugging in your heart is not so much loss as it is love and affection for someone who made a difference in your life. And as I struggled to find a way to understand this feeling, I remembered that John taught us about grief as well, through his own mourning for the loss of his friend, Bob DeLuca. I remember seeing that as a relatively young man. He showed us that it's okay to be absolutely devastated. It's okay to keep being wrecked by that loss, years later. I came across emails he wrote written many years after Bob's death, where John talked openly about watching videos with Bob and weeping. He didn't shy away from grief. So I'd ask all of us to read the monument, keep reading his words, keep reading his letters, keep watching his videos. I'd like to close by singing the Sussex Drinking Song, which Ian Robb and Steve Woodruff were generous enough to share with me about 30 years ago. John used to say it was the best drinking song, and he asked me to sing it a few times at times like these. So I'll do my best to sing it for John today, and you're welcome to join in. On Sussex Downs, where I was bred, where lanes in autumn rains are red, where the air untumbles in his bed, and gusty gales go by, where branches bear in virgin glen and berry hill is a whitening then. I drink strong ale with gentlemen, which no one can deny, deny. Downs, from Hurst Pier Point to 
I knew that we were allowed to have stories where we said, fuck it, we did it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> My remarks would be much longer. <laughs> In January of 2016, the Manhattan Street Project, with whom John played for 40 years, and I with him for the last 20 years at that time, organized a cultural journey to Hamburg, Germany, where we, along with 80 or so other musicians, friends, and colleagues, studied the Bronze and Platz Street Project, part of which you just heard. It's a wonderful piece, full of energy and longing, and it has one feature that's pretty unique the string part of the picture. In the movement you just heard, all the instruments except the viola are instructed to put their mutes on, dampening the sound. But the viola is told not to do this. It should stand up, not muted, as are the others. It's an interesting choice on Brahms's part because the viola doesn't always have the melody. It certainly does at the beginning, and is undoubtedly the preeminent voice in much of the movement. But there are moments when other voices have the tune, and the viola is not told to put the mute on then either. So even when others have the melody, you certainly still hear the viola. John loved this piece. <laughs> <laughs> At the conclusion of these conferences, I would often give out sort of silly awards to some gently recognizing them for some accomplishment like falling asleep in the lecture or <laughs> missing a bus. That year I gave to all the violists membership in a fictitious honorary society that I called the Violas Play Too Damn Socks <laughs> or <laughs> uh, The president of this society was none other than Maestro Dexter. We had a little ceremony, and then each new member was given a pin with Brahms' likeness attached to a little slip of paper that said, Consolino? I don't think so. <laughs> I think some members of that society are here today. Yes? Can I ask them to rise with their medals? You have your those yes in the cake, maybe? <laughs> That's what I always felt about John. Concertino, I don't know this. For many years, I played in a festival at Bard College, and John Norokoy and I would room together. It was a great deal for me because I got to come home every evening from rehearsals and be cooked for by the two of them. We called them Julie and Julia. The, two of them. the culmination of these early fortnights was a dinner that we called Thanksgiving. John and Arno would go to this special butcher somewhere in upstate New York and buy hundreds of dollars worth of steak cut from some cow who had been massaged every day at the cabin. Then they would, every year, mind you, John, every single year, would buy a small charcoal grill, which they would then leave for whatever students happened to be in that apartment at the time. They would grill the steak with a crap load of garlic and serve it to those of us lucky enough to be invited, along with an array of other delicacies too numerous to mention. I know why, my God, the wine. Concertino? I don't think so. John can be a real pain in the ass. <laughs> he and I had a running, shall we say, discussion that went something like this. This is John. Cal, you have the melody there. I think you should play a little louder. <laughs> Me. John, I have the melody there. I think you should play a little softer. <laughs> John, a knowing smile. Me thinking to myself, I better play a little louder. <laughs> John can dish it out, but he can also take it. He was honest with himself about his brashness and quickness. And although he didn't suffer fools gladly, he offered, often considered himself in the former camp rather than the latter. I always knew I was getting his honest self. I knew those who he taught and coached all the same way. And I always trusted that this unfiltered self was tempered, tempered by deep care and respect. How should you know? I don't think so. John cared deeply that things got done right. 
In the MSQ, we tasked him with the incredibly important stuff. He was the bookkeeper, the grant writer, often the liaison to the manager of concert promoter. He, along with Karen, always did an important amount of work for European conferences and for the summer camp. I think sometimes he did all this work because he didn't trust that we could or would do it. <laughs> By the way, I'm not a reasonable worry, actually. But I also think he liked the organizational puzzles of getting the books to match to the penny and knowing exactly how, bus, how big the bus is. You saw all the sheets of each day's responsibilities that he and Karen passed out to us and knew the endless hours spent on the tiniest details. You would understand why all these things ran so smoothly. So smoothly that it felt effortless. He taught me so much about how to take care of people, how to run a festival, how to organize a day. John lived life fully and I always wanted to know his recommendations for which restaurants to go to when you're on tour. During our Europe trips, he was always going out of the town when I was staying in my room watching TV. He always was the last to leave the social hours at the end of camp, summer camp nights. He was always the last guy there. I remember one year before camp music, we arranged for a special keg of beer to be delivered to the camp. So we would all try it. No swill, he would say. No swill. A couple of years ago, he injured himself lifting weights at the gym. John, what the hell are you doing? My God. Often, when I was lucky enough to be part of a scouting trip at future conferences, he and I would try out restaurants and bars just to make sure they were good enough to participate. <laughs> and this continued all through John's illness.
Samar, John's friend and companion of many years. I'd like to thank all of the performers today, and especially Cal Roosman, for putting together such a wonderful program to honor John. Music was the central and unifying force in John's life. It was a common thread that wove together the many parts of his life, over time and across distances. It was music that brought John to Pinewoods Camp as a teenager in the early 1960s, where he discovered and then became possessed by Morris Nancy. <laughs> this was a vital source of enjoyment for the rest of his life that provided a brotherhood of long-lasting friendships. And as Jamie mentioned, yes, he went to Pinewoods to study viola da gama. And when he first told me that, I said, you, viola da gama, I couldn't believe it. But as it turns out, there is photographic evidence of this. <laughs> and uh, Margaret Liddell has the receipts, so to speak. <laughs> it was also music that brought John to New York from Iowa. During his army service in the late 1960s, when he was stationed at West Point and started studying at Juilliard. But it was chamber music, in particular, that was his lifelong passion. He frequently said that at an early age, chamber music had grabbed him by the shirt collars and just would not let him go. So chamber music and string quartets then took him on to Binghamton and Hamilton, New York, which is where he met Toby who was one of his longest standing friends. And again, we're so happy that Toby was able to play on John's viola today. Those of you who are familiar with the instrument, you may have thought at the beginning of the program that you've heard the old ghost. You did. John returned then to New York to set about establishing himself professionally, picking up freelance gigs in orchestras, playing in the pit for Broadway shows, and working as a studio musician for film and television. Fun fact, John even has a brief on-screen appearance in the Pink Panther. <laughs> but it was chamber music that kept its hold on him, and he joined the Manhattan String Quartet, where he would remain the violist for 40 years. These were some of the most professionally fulfilling years of his life, with accolades for recordings, Summers at Music Mountain, the historic trips to the Soviet Union under the auspices of the U.S. State Department, and extensive travel on concert tours to Europe, South America, and Japan, as well as across the United States. We're very fortunate today to have with us many of John's colleagues from the Manhattan Quartet, Roy Lewis, Judy Bly, Ken Free. Chris Finkel, Cal Wiersma, and Kurt Mackman. Over the years with the MSQ, John also discovered his love and dedication for teaching and coaching chamber music. He was always very humble about his teaching, saying that he got more back from his students, that he was learning more than they were, that he was getting the better end of the deal. So yes, music, the common thread, the unifying force, across the decades and across the continents. For many years, John was the guy in the MSQ who organized the European conferences and workshops. He thoroughly enjoyed those planning trips, where he got to scope out the activities for the conference agenda and where he had the opportunity to meet music scholars, museum directors, musician colleagues, and even a few diplomats and elected officials. His endless curiosity and his interest in history were always apparent. John could never pass a historical plaque on the side of the building without stopping to read it and to learn something. He was also deeply interested in making connections with local people on these trips. When we were in Leipzig in 2004 on a planning trip, John met Henrik Lehmann Grupa, the first democratically elected mayor of Leipzig who was also an amateur violist. So John immediately offered to coach him at his regular Tuesday nights from the quartet, and a lasting friendship was established. John's genuine interest and inquisitive manner resulted frequently in friendships with museum directors, at the Bach Archive in Leipzig, at the Mozarteum in Salzburg, 
the Verdi Institute in Parma, the Bartok Archive in Budapest, and the Brahms edition in Kiel. Our many trips to Prague resulted in an abundance of enduring friendships. With our dear friend, Yerji Ludwig, and four generations of his family, as well as treasured friendships with musicians Evgen Ratai, Brendan Sedlodowski, and Mika Blaschkova. And Mika came from Prague uh, just this past week so that she could participate in this weekend's musical event. I was thinking today, as I greeted so many of you entering the building, what all these people have in common is that they had the privilege to know John and to share some of his interests his humor, his curiosity, his determination, and his kindness. And that idea of his love of music and the power it has to bring people together across time and space, I think that should continue on in each of us as we leave here today and carry on with our lives. So, let's get started on that journey. Please join me and John's family for reception downstairs in the social hall. And I want to thank you all so very much for being here today. <coughs> 